On this week's What the Ship, we update some previous stories. We talk about how soft demand is pushing ocean spot rates to the lowest sustainable level. Russian seaborne crude flows climb with no sign of easing. The Chinese and Philippine Coast Guard nearly collide. And we talk about the maritime evacuation of Sudan. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this week's What the Ship. So for all the new subscribers, and we have a lot here, it's been a record week here for what's going on with shipping. This is the weekly show, What the Ship. It is about 30 minutes long, broken down into five major stories. And you can go ahead and hit the tabs down below and jump to the story you want to hear or just let the whole video play. But this is my attempt to really synthesize what I consider to be the five biggest news stories across the maritime domain, both commercially and uh, militarily, where the military intercedes with the commercial. Uh, really try to knit this all together and put it into one nice package and then a little bit of analysis at the end. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this week's stories. So story number one is usually updates, updates of previous stories we did. So one of the stories we did a while back was about the research vessel Petrel. This is the vessel formerly owned by Paul Allen, purchased by the U.S. Navy that was in a dry dock in Edinburgh, Scotland. And the vessel rolled over to its starboard side. Many people injured. Well, just found out that the vessel has been refloated and is back out. This story from Maritime Executive has very little detail about it, and really more of a past story. But this came from Reddit. I had one of my subscribers send me this image. And so here's the vessel refloated back out in the dry dock. It looks like they did exactly what we discussed in the video. They slowly flooded the dry dock. They had put some braces on the vessel to prevent it from sliding off the blocks. There's a great video if you want to see it. Uh, e. Sisman, who does yacht news, kind of what I do in, in global shipping. He does with yachts, but he does it much better than I do. He's a He is fantastic. If you don't follow him, he's, he's really great. All you want to know about yachts is you follow him. Uh, great video with some drone fit footage he has. I'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, you can see it. He literally released this video, and I think the next day they floated the vessel out. So it was a little bit of timing on him. He didn't realize that was happening so soon, but he really gives you the kind of detail that you can see. And I'm actually going to work on a video with some more specifics about how they refloated this. Obviously, the other story we've been talking about is the Pablo. This is the explosion off the coast of Malaysia. Latest information still has three crew members missing. Uh, no telling if they were on board the vessel or, or if, if they are still on board the vessel or were blown off the vessel. Uh, investigation is going on regarding this vessel. I ex expect them to be towing this vessel into a port somewhere soon. Uh, this vessel is completely total. There's going to be a constructive total loss. There's no rebuilding this vessel. Uh, the explosion was absolutely just cataclysmic. And again, this is a vapor explosion. There'll be a question about the inert gas system on board the vessel. Uh, that is probably what caused this explosion. And then we come over to Iran. 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 I, I apologize. I keep saying this and I don't mean to be disrespectful. It's just I got used to saying it for 50 something years that way. Uh, this deals with the seizures of vessels, two by Iran, one by the United States. Again, what we're seeing here is three elements of stories all coming together. The U.S. first diverted a vessel, didn't actually seize it, but had a company divert a vessel. This was the Suez Rajan carrying Iranian, uh, Iran, Iranian oil to the United States. The Iranians responded by seizing and diverting the tanker Advantage Suite. And then the third tanker involved was this tanker here, the, the Navoy. Uh, and Neovi uh, is an interesting case here. So this story in G-Captain uh, is amazing to me. But for this statement here, this is a Reuters story. But Greece issued a series of warnings to ship owners to avoid sailing close to Iranian waters before Tehran seized two tankers amid hiding tensions in the region. It is physically impossible not to sail close to Iran's waters. If you go through the Straits of Hormuz, there, there's no room there. I, I mean, you're literally bordering on Iranian waters. So the idea that you can tell your tankers, you know, hey, avoid, you know, sailing close to them, that's not possible. But the issue that's developing now is, is why was the second tanker, the Neovi, seized? Uh, this story uh, over in Splash 24-7 
talks about the speculation surrounding the second tanker seizure, what was the issues behind it. There was a note listed by Tanker Tracker. Uh, this is an outfit that tracks tankers around the world, especially their cargoes for people. Uh, but basically it said, we do not have time to reply to journalists today regarding Iran's seizure of Niovi, but given the tanker's history of re receiving Iranian oil during the sanctions era, as well as being currently empty of cargo, we believe today's actions were entirely staged theatrics. So there's a question about was the, was the, the, the business, the, the company that owns this uh, tanker working in conjunction with the Iranians to stage this. But then there's this amazing piece by Toma Renan over at Lloyd's. And fortunately, Lloyd's put this out beyond the paywall so you can read it. But basically, he makes the argument through a lot of sources that the seized tanker was part of a legal dispute with sanctioned entities over the Iranian cargo. I'm going to go and do a separate video on this because it's really a lot to unpack. Again, this is the great dynamic world of ocean shipping. It is just uh, a myriad of intricacies, legal minutia, and it's great. It's, it's why I love this area so much, because it's not simple. If you want simple, then, you know, go deal with planes. Ships are difficult. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number two. So let's go ahead and jump into the container sector. So obviously the container sector has gotten a lot of attention because of the drop in container levels, but it's very important to remember that 2022 and 2021 are aberrations. They were ridiculously high years in terms of containers, record years as a matter of fact. And what we've seen is basically returned back down to 2019 pre-COVID levels. And these stories here, a series of them, are really addressing that issue. So this first one over in G-Captain, it's a Lodestar story. Soft demand pushes ocean spot rates to lowest sustainable levels. So you may remember when we were talking about record profits for the ocean carriers. They were just reaping it in. In 2022, uh, they made more profits in one year than they did in all the 2010s, the entire decade combined. It's crazy. And then they did that too in 2021. So they have made record profits. Now the question is, what is the level that's going to sustain this? Basically where we're at. And there's a lot of factors at play here. Remember, we have issues on the West Coast of the United States. We have a labor dispute between the Pacific Maritime Association, the International Longshore Warehouse Union. There are class one rail issues. There are warehousing issues. There are trucking issues. There are a whole batch of series of issues. And what we're seeing is while the trans-Pacific rates have bottomed out, I mean, below pre-COVID levels, we're still seeing rates to Europe and uh, across the Atlantic at fairly good levels. I, I mean, not pre-COVID, but higher than that. But the question is, will it eventually bottom out? There was a story the other week, matter of fact, an interesting one, talking about the Panama Canal is having issues with allowing fully loaded ships through the Panama Canal because of low water levels. That's going to impact the shipment of containers going to the East and Gulf Coast via the, the new lane of the Panama Canal. Then you have this global freight shows signs of bottoming out. So I think across the board, everyone is expecting this, but this is not unusual. Can I be clear? First quarter of the year is always a slow year. If you look at the past five years, that chart is the same. It, it, it bottoms out February, March into April. But the expectation here is after April, expect to see it start to rise. It's not going to be a huge uptick like we saw in 2020, 2021 or 2022. But you can expect to see that uptick as demand, and especially for the holiday season, begins shipping goods across. This story over at Freightwaves, Greg Miller, Maersk, downturn, unpredicted course, liners acting rationally. So he, he this is the liner saying they're acting rationally. I have a problem with that. I, I think I think sailors drunk with money, uh, you can't really trust them. So we're not exactly sure they're going to be doing all the rational things. But in particularly, the first quarter Maersk numbers came in high. I mean, they were at $4 billion profit. They had been forecasting 3.5. Nowhere near the record 20, 30 billion they were making during the height of COVID. But this is a heck of a lot more than they were making in the 2010 years. And so one of the things we are seeing is that the ocean liners are doing more money than before. And a lot of this has to do, while we see the spot rates falling, remember, this is the year, May 1st, is when the new ocean contracts, the long-term ocean contracts go into effect. And so you have to lock in your rates for the year. 
And those rates are much different than the spot rates. Spot rates account for maybe 30% of the rates for containers going across the ocean. About 70% are long-term rates. And those long-term rates are higher than the spot rates right now. And that's a big issue because you don't want to be dependent on spot rates because as we saw during COVID, they fluctuate. Yeah, it may cost you $1,500 now to get a container across the Pacific, but at the height of COVID, it was $25,000. Now, we don't expect that to happen again, but then again, we didn't expect COVID to happen. And the amount of black swan events that have been dive bombing on us are at record numbers. And then finally, this issue here from Lodestar, really important one, can slow steaming offset container shipping capacities problems. The new IMO 2023 regulations are in effect. Ships have to record their emissions data now. And if your emissions data reaches a certain level, you may have to take the ship offline because you are emitting too much carbon. And this is getting to be a big issue. The older tonnage is going to be phased out. There's a lot of issues right now with people saying, well, the older tonnage isn't going away as fast as we thought it was. It will be. There's no question about that. I think everybody is keeping tonnage right now in kind of in their back pocket just in case there is a surge. And they're waiting for these new vessels to come online. Once the new vessels come online, these larger vessels, more fuel efficient, can use dual fuel sources, LNG, ammonia, hydrogen, you name it, all these different various fuel sources, methanol. Once they come online, you're going to see these older tonnage sold off to regional carriers, to older companies, and then eventually for scrap. And that's what we can expect to see. So the container market is definitely in a period of flux. We're keeping a big eye on it. All right, let's go to story number three. Story number three, let's talk about oil. We were talking about oil at the beginning here with the explosion of the Pablo off the coast of Malaysia. We were talking about the seizure of three tankers by the United States and Iran. Let's talk about the real root of one of the big problems, and that is the Russia-Ukraine war. One of the issues ongoing has been the oil price cap against the Russians. The G7 and the EU have instituted two price caps, one on crude oil, $60 a barrel, and another one on diesel at $100 a barrel. Because the EU and the G7 don't want to stop the flow of Russian oil or diesel because it would completely disrupt the world economy. But what they want to do is hurt Russia and make it so that it can still flow oil and diesel, but not really profit off of it. And what that has done is lower the price of oil across the board because Russia is flooding the market with cheap oil and diesel. A story by Bloomberg, Russian seaborne crude flows climb with no sign of easing. And what we're seeing here is really the flow of this oil. And where we're, the oil is going is to places like Asia, not going so much to Europe, but we'll talk about how it's getting to Europe and how much this oil is really flowing in huge record numbers. So that when you look at this story, one of the things that becomes very clear is that Russia is increasing its output of oil. We're seeing that across the board and we're seeing it's going <clears throat> longer distances. And that means going back to the stories we talked about with the tanker seizures, tankers which are not being built in any large numbers the tanker fleet is getting older it's now having to travel further distances which means further ton miles in other words a ton of fuel has to go more miles to be delivered that's putting a big pressure on the oil companies the tanker companies to deliver this fuel what are we seeing across the board let's look at a batch of stories here number one russian oil still powering europe's cars with the help of india India is one of the big beneficiaries of Russian crude oil. Massive amounts of Russian crude oil is heading to India. That oil is being refined, turned into diesel fuel. That diesel fuel then is being shipped back to Europe, back to the United States, and so that the U.S. and Europe and the G7 and the EU nations are getting Russian diesel fuel. It's just going through India. I made the case of talking about how India is basically laundering Russian crude, it's its maybe not the exact reference I should have used because they are doing something that's perfectly legal. They are refining the oil, turning it into diesel. That is new fuel. It's not Russian oil anymore. It's Indian diesel fuel. And then they're selling it. But this is what's helping Russia to maintain itself. It is very hard to sanction Russia through a commodities unless you're going to cut it off entirely. And that's what you see happening here. We've seen issues across the board with some of this fuel getting into other countries. There was a case in Spain, for example, where there was an issue about Spain violating the G7 EU sanctions by taking uh, Russian diesel. Now, 
Spain says there's no proof of that, but we do know off the coast of Spain, there's a lot of ship to ship transfers taking place of oil and diesel being transferred to other vessels. We know that LNG has been the biggest gain across the board because of people trying to get themselves off oil and diesel. Liquefied natural gas has become the big issue. Natural gas had been being piped into Europe. Natural gas pipelines had existed, go, went across Ukraine, still go across Ukraine. We had the Nord Stream lines. We had a whole variety of natural gas pipelines coming from Russia into Europe. Those have been turned off or blown up in case of Nord Stream. And what has replaced it now is liquefied natural gas. And that has been a big boom for the United States. The U.S. has been importing huge amounts of liquefied natural gas, a industry we got into in 2016. The problem with LNG exports in the United States is we had an explosion at the Freeport plant that put part of that plant offline for a long time. And then the Maritime Administration is sitting on permits to, to allow the creation of new ex, uh, export facilities in Texas, Louisiana, and a few other places. So there's a lot of things that need to be done to keep the U.S. as an LNG exporting nation. Same time, Germany is stepping up its imports of liquefied natural gas over fears of pipeline attacks. And this is not just Nord Stream, this is the overland pipelines and pipelines within Europe. And so they want to make sure that they have a secondary source, and this is the arrival of liquefied natural gas. But understand, liquefied natural gas is much more expensive than natural gas. You have to liquefy the natural gas to transport it by sea. That means you have to cool it, cool it down minus 160, I think, Celsius. you got to get it cold. And that costs a lot of money. You have to have a LNG tanker. You have to charter it. And then you need a facility where you pump the liquefied natural gas to, into a facility and then regasify it, either a platform vessel or a shore facility. And then this story also talks about this is how the U.S. is seeking for alternative oil sources. So the Advantage suite that was sailing from Kuwait was heading to Houston, Texas with a load of oil on board. And it was a Chevron load. And people are asking, why are we importing oil from Kuwait to Houston, Texas, when Houston, Texas is exporting oil? It's because of our refinery capacity and the fact that we have to mix our oil to work in our refineries. Because the oil we produce, especially fracking oil, doesn't work very well in the refineries we have. And we're not building new refineries. And this is why we were importing Mideast oil, why we're getting Russian oil, and now why we've eased sanctions on Venezuela and we're allowing Chevron to basically ship Venezuelan oil, which had previously been under sanctions by the U.S., to the U.S. So I've been talking about with uh, Iran and the tankers seizing vessels, the issue about maintaining the open seaways. And this has been a core issue that has been talked about. A lot of discussion in the comments on my videos about why the U.S. Navy isn't doing things to stop uh, the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard's attack on vessels. Uh, let me be clear about this. The, the U.S. Navy does not take upon as one of its primary missions to defend non-U.S. vessels. It just doesn't. Uh, we saw that in the tanker war of the 1980s, and we've seen that throughout. Unless a vessel is sinking in distress, you very rarely will see a U.S. Navy vessel intervene in between them unless requested by an allied nation, and it goes through a huge amount of checks. The time we escorted vessels in the tanker war in the late 80s were U.S. flag vessels. These were Kuwaiti vessels that had been reflagged over to the U.S. registry, flew U.S. flags, had U.S. crews on board. All right, suffice it, go jump over to the South China Sea now, and the regional conflict between many of the players there are over what are called EEZs, uh, Exclusive Economic Zones, and the South China Sea is littered with them. And under the UNCLOS Treaty, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, nations have the economic control over areas 200 miles around their land. That becomes a problem where they overlap, and then there was a treaty that hammered out where zones exist. However, China has, who's a signatory, by the way, of UNCLOS, uh, China signed off on this treaty. Ironically, the U.S. has not, but China has. Yet there are issues over sovereignty and control of certain waters, and in particular, China is very concerned over a potential blockage of the South China Sea by many nations. If you look at a map of trade, the vast majority of Chinese trade goes through the South China Sea, through the Straits of Malacca, into the Indian Ocean, either to the Persian Gulf, to the Suez Canal, to the Europe, 
or South Africa into the southern areas. The, the There's a substantial goes across the Pacific, obviously, but not as much as goes through the South China Sea. And the South China Sea has the potential to be a bottleneck, a choke point against the Chinese. And the Chinese have basically taken a large amount of action to ensure that that ocean and that sea remains viable, including dispatching their new Coast Guard over. And this picture is one of the best ones that shows you the scope and scale of the Chinese Coast Guard versus the Philippines Coast Guard. That is a Chinese Coast Guard cutter. It's one of the largest. That is an over 10,000 ton Coast Guard cutter. That is a massive Coast Guard cutter. This is not a tiny little boat. And the fact that China calls them Coast Guard is really important because Coast Guards are law enforcement. Navies are not law enforcement. Navies are political elements of a country. They do not execute law enforcement missions. Even the U.S. Navy doesn't do that. This is why you see the Coast Guard, for example, in the Persian Gulf and other areas around the world. But this confrontation between Philippines and uh, China is very indicative, indicative because Philippines seems to be orientating closer and closer to the U.S. And that is pr prompting responses. <coughs> Excuse me. So when the U.S. backs the Philippines, which we do, that will garner a response for this. Understand, China has a long history. They remember their history immensely. They know that the way Japan was strangled in World War II was in an operation called Operation Strangle, where they were cut off from their supplies in the South China Sea. American submarines, and then later on the invasion of the Philippines, basically severed the Japanese access to the Southeast Asia, to Indonesia, to Malaysia. This is the area that the Japanese invaded at the start of the war for their natural resources after they were embargoed by the U.S., Britain, and the Dutch. So this is foremost in their mind. They know this. And as the U.S. and the Philippines net stronger alliances, has just been a huge military exercise that took place in the Philippines. The Chinese want to demonstrate the fact that they are there and they are not going to allow the U.S. and the Philippines to cut their supply line and their sea lines of communications. And so do I think this is overtly war? No, I think it's just nations demonstrating, kind of pounding on their chest that we are here and we can also counter what you're doing. I, I think it's a very much a little bit of brinksmanship. All right, let's go to our last story of the day. Our last story of the day deals with the evacuation of personnel from the nation of Sudan, which has been a warning that's been going on for weeks now. The U.S. State Department issued a warning quite a long time ago now for Americans to evacuate Sudan, get out of the area. Other nations have done the same. However, things have really broken down in Sudan, and this prompted a maritime evacuation. Now, you can argue, well, why don't you do an aerial evacuation? Maritime evacuations are much better because, number one, it's safer. It's, it, it's hard to shoot down a ship. Uh, it's easy to shoot down an airplane. And more importantly, you can secure the ports and get a lot more people out a lot faster by ship in some ways, also bring out cargo and all those elements. So what we're seeing right now is a, a maritime evacuation of Sudan by many nations going across. And in particular, they're leaving from the port of Sudan on the Red Sea, heading across the Red Sea to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia or down the Djibouti at the very end of the Red Sea. And the U.S. is using several vessels that have gotten a kind of a mixed reputation so far in the U.S. Navy about this. And so I really wanted to highlight this because I thought it was a really interesting story. So one of the, the vessels the U.S. is using, what's called an EPF, it's an Expeditionary Fast Transport, basically a civilian catamaran, Austal ferry. Ever go to Europe, go around the world, these ferries are everywhere. Uh, Austal, which is an Australian company, builds these fast ferries. Uh, you ride them everywhere. I rode on one between Montevideo and Buenos Aires uh, uh, prior to COVID. These vessels were being built by the U.S., Prior to COVID, uh, initially it was a joint venture of the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, they were going to build 30 of these things. The Army backed out uh, of the program. Then the, basically the Marines backed out too. And so the Navy started building these things, gave them to the Military Sealift Command, the civilian agency that operates merchant shipping for the Navy. And these things really had no mission for a long time. They didn't. They just, I don't know what, they, they just basically were building them. 
and they weren't operating. And even now, we're building more down in Austell uh, Shipyard in, in uh, Mobile, Alabama, while laying some of these up. And they've had issues. Uh, they've operated these vessels on the high seas, and they're really not designed to be out in the middle of the Atlantic in the Pacific. They're, they're, they're ferries. So aluminum catamaran hulls operating in rough water, you get cracks. You get cracks a lot. Matter of fact, the most recent one, the Apalachicola, which was delivered, had twice as many cracks as earlier vessels. I think it's somewhere in the range of about 1,200. Uh, so big issues with these vessels. However, this mission is exactly what these vessels were designed for. If you go back prior to, you know, the, the, the 80s, and when you saw elements where a country would devolve into chaos and you had to do evacuations, ocean evacuation was the way. And the U.S. would call upon commercial shipping to come in and help in these evacuations. We did it in Vietnam, for example, did it in Lebanon. We did it in a whole batch of places. And what you're seeing here is an old school evacuation of personnel. And this vessel, I would argue, is perfect for this. This is exactly why you want EPFs in regional areas. It's not a destroyer. It's not an amphibious vessel. You can't go storming ashore with Marines. But when you want to haul people out very quickly, this is the vessel you want. It is perfect for that. Shallow draft, come into the port, put the ramp down, load up three to 500 people on board, zip across to another port, Jeddah or Djibouti, and then come back. It is ideally perfect for this. This is what these vessels should be doing. These things should be everywhere around the world. They should be everywhere within all our major fleets for the United States. Uh, these are the type of vessels that do that soft power mission that you don't need a warship to do. This is a perfect mission for it. You also don't need to bring in the Marines every time. You can put a small detachment on here to secure the vessel, secure the port, secure the dock, and you can operate. You don't need a entire massive Marine Expeditionary Unit Amphibious Ready Group to do this. Now, if you have to go inland, you need helicopters, then there are other vessels that can be used. As a matter of fact, one of the other vessels coming in, this is a USNI, uh, U.S. Naval Institute story, is the other vessel they're bringing in is this one right here, the USS Lewis B. Puller. This is a modified Alaska-class super tanker that has been turned into an expeditionary support base. Basically what they did is they built a super tanker, they cut the middle out of it, they slapped up a deck on it, one of the largest flight decks in the United States Navy, except for uh, aircraft carriers and helicopter carriers. They've got a hangar up here forward, they have crew and berthing areas up forward, they have a deck here which has small boats they can launch, and basically what this thing is, it's a floating friggin' island that can go out anywhere. It's a big lumbering thing. It is not maneuverable. It is, it is, a, it is, a, it is an absolute horse. Uh, it is terrible. Uh, but it is a great platform. And so that if you need the helicopters, you can stage right there. You can fly helicopters on and off. You can get people from the interior of Sudan to the vessel. You can bring the Brunswick, which is the vessel that was being used here, the EPF, alongside, transfer them to them. The Brunswick has a helicopter pad. You can actually land them on them. You could basically operate like a lily pad. These vessels are great. You have to think beyond the box. Sometimes you don't need all the bells and whistles that the military wants. These are the type of soft power platforms that we see many nations do. The Royal Fleet Auxiliary of the Royal Navy, the Chinese do this with the, uh, uh, the Peace Arc, their, their hospital ship. Uh, a lot of nations do this, and they don't get the recognition they deserve. These ships are crewed by merchant mariners. They're, they're merchant mariners in the employ of the U.S. government, and they're doing exactly the job we want to see done. So anyway, five stories across the spectrum. We went all the way from updates to the evacuation from Sudan. Uh, obviously a lot going on here, trying to keep you as up to date as I can. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, to all our new subscribers, again, got 10,000 new subscribers last week. Just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we're over 90,000 subscribers now, heading to that magic 100,000 so I can put a plaque up behind me here. Uh, I am appreciative. I, I thank you so much for the support you give, for the commentary, for the information you all send me. Uh, you make me look a lot smarter than I am because I'm not this smart. Uh, but more importantly, you support this page and that allows me to put these videos together. So take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. Oops, sorry. Support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and you can become a patron of the page, either monthly or yearly. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll see you next week.